What's happening? Welcome right, to the Grim Leftovers track. Show. Oh, Grim I here muted that. Every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. <laughs> if you heard me talking during the opening little bits there, it's because I was confused. I had, I had muted my headset, and so the song was playing, and I just couldn't hear it. Anyway, welcome, folks. This is the Grim Leftovers program right here on this Monday, November 11, 2019. 11-11. Some of y'all out there, depending where you are in the world, if you're in the U.S. of A., call it Veterans Day. If you're in Canada, I think it's... Uh, Armed Forces Day, I don't know, uh, Armistice Day. Uh, it's various military hero worship of the uh, various war mongers, war mongers out there in the world. And, uh, yeah, no, I celebrate none of it. I don't thank you for your service. Absolutely not. Anyway, it is 11-11, which means it's Circle's birthday. Happy birthday, Circle! Uh, <laughs> and other things. Also, I am uh, told and I am aware that tonight is a full moon right here on this planet Earth. So, yes, full moon day for us all. Full moon, full full moon grim leftovers. Also, uh, if you had an opportunity to watch it on the interwebs, I, I doubt you could see it with your telescope. Maybe you could. I don't know. But the uh, planet Mercury was transiting... Uh, the sun, so it just just see a little little dot going across the surface of the sun there today. So all kinds of like solar space stuff going on, and then stuff going on here on Earth, which is far less important. Well, I guess unless you live here on planet Earth, in which case it may be somewhat important. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, man. Anyway, welcome to everybody out there that may be tuned in in various places. You may be tuned in from around the planet, and you're looking up in the sky saying, Hey, that does look like a full moon. Yeah. So, anyway, but if you're out there listening in on RLM Radio from all the places you can tune in from, we welcome you. We, we as in the people at RLM, not just me. We here at RLM welcome you. And come on over and jump on in to the chat here on reallibertymedia.com. Or or uh, over there on rlmradio.xyz, it it is there as well. And uh, so come come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And you can talk to all the great folks that are here today, here tonight, depending on where you are. It's still evening here. It's five o'clock, five p.m. So uh, yeah, we uh, it's not quite dark outside yet, although it's getting very close. Uh, as that happens around this time of year, after they shift the time on us for reasons unknown to me. Yeah, sun pimple sock puppet. <laughs> anyway, howdy to the folks here. We got the bar man and the beetle, 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 beetle. Myself and the moose girl are here. Uh, and I, Chalcedonian free enslaved, Mr. Free Enslaved, joining us here on the RLM radio. Graham Z and Java Doctor, Mr. Meister Meister Brow, the woodman. Uh, Ponder, Gander, and Poopster, and Prince. Uh, Miss Kate, lovely Miss Kate, yes indeed. Uh, yeah. uh, Rob Works, hey Robert. How you doing down there in, oh, Arkansas. No longer in Texas, over there in Arkansas. Mr. Romes. Uh, the Vanna White Bot, Mr. Vinny in PG mode. You would think he might be rated R, but nope, he's just PG. He's, he's not even NC-17. Uh, we got the Weather Dork, Phantom, and Asmodeus, Asmo2, uh, CC66, the Choskura, Choskura, Cyber, Cyborg, Noodle, Half Bot, Half Human, Miss Dam, Van Meter, Donna, Donna, Duh, hey Duh, how you doing man, uh, we, we got End Siv and Frumpy and Grunt, JJ's, JJ's on, over there on Webcom Radio. Uh, we have Pwn Sauce and Raptor Jesus. The Raptor Jesus. Uh, Donnie, the real Donnie, the real Donnie Blue. Mr. Sock Puppet, how you doing, Sock? Uh, SLC Mike from up there in Mormon country. The Slim Jim Flim. Slim Jim, come on, man. 
<laughs> did, did, did I, did I, did I, did I, I don't know if I chanted Zep or not. I might have. It would be an unconscious, subcon not a subconscious thing, yeah. All right, the spot as the holiest of Rogers and Mr. Zippix, who Mr. Zippix last week joined Poopster and Prince on the, the Power Hour on Thursday evening. So, uh, yeah, check out the uh, Power Hour over there at some point in time, should you so desire. I do have a bunch of stories lined up here for you. I don't know how great any of them are, but, you know, there's stories that I had marked in my list for various reasons that I wanted to share with y'all. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to share these stories. Because that's what we do here on Grim Leftovers. Share these kind of stale stories. Uh, stories from a, a day or ten or a thirty gone by. And um, try and make some sense out of stuff that makes no sense. In this world. <laughs> now, this first story. And, and my thought about this was uh, to the industrious musician, maybe writer. Uh, I think better off a musician than a writer. But uh, think about this as a song title, or maybe even the name of a band. Doing Cocaine with the Devil. Sounds to me like a great song name. Doing Cocaine with the Devil. <laughs> All right, on the New York Post here, from October 8, 2019, College student pleads guilty to killing Bestie, a uh, best friend, I guess that would be. Uh, she says she was doing cocaine with the devil. Yes, indeed. A Virginia college student told police that she was doing cocaine with the devil when she flew into a psychotic rage and fatally knifed her best friend and roommate more than 30 times. That takes a lot of work. Thirty times stabbing a knife into somebody. That, that's, that's, uh, that, that's some rage going on. Uh, Luisa Ines Tudela Harris Cutting. She has five names. Luisa Ines Tudela Harris Cutting, 21, pleaded guilty on Monday to a January 24th slaying of Alexa Cannon and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Cutting which is a kind of an appropriate name, I suppose, Cutting. Cutting admitted to stabbing Cannon to death in the off-campus apartment the two students shared near Radford University in Southern Virginia. Cutting had been binging on a cocktail of drugs, including co <laughs> cocaine, mushrooms, Adderall, Xanax, and marijuana. She was hopped up. She was hopped up. Uh, during the confession to police, Cutting allegedly made rambling statements about the apocalypse and recited the Hail Mary prayer a number of times in Spanish. <laughs> she also repeatedly tried to shove her entire hand in her mouth. She was fisting herself. What? <laughs> did I say that? Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. Uh, during her sentencing Monday, Cutting offered a brief statement asking for forgiveness and expressing regret for the killing. There are no words for this tragedy, and my heart is filled with sorrow and grief. Prior to the killing, uh, Cannon shared glowing, glowing social media posts about Cutting, saying, she was her best friend. A post on Cannon's Facebook page from July 2018 read, So incredibly proud of my best friend, Louisa Cutting, for becoming the Latino Student Alliance president. I know you're going to be amazing with everything you do. Love you more. Love you so much, Cutting wrote in response. Love you so much I'm going to stab you 30 plus times. <laughs> as I do cocaine with the devil. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> the The real importance of this article is zero. I mean, it is to the woman that got stabbed and also the woman that did the stabbing. 
and the families and friends of those they're involved. But, I mean, on a global scale, nothing. I mean, it's nothing. It's just something I found interesting and decided to share. <laughs> this next article may have a slightly more widespread effect on people, depending on who you are and what you like to do. I, I myself am not a big fan of the vodka, vodka. But some of y'all out there do drink the vodka. And um, I'm going to say, if you are drinking vodka, maybe you want to uh, not drink something called atomic vodka. Atomic vodka. Huh. Did, did they Were they looking ahead, or did they plan this out? This vodka was made using contaminated grain from Chernobyl. <laughs> yes, indeed, this was Atomic Vodka. Atomic Vodka is the first consumer product to be made from ingredients from the nuclear reactor's exclusion zone. Yeah. There's a small experimental farm located in the abandoned heartland of Chernobyl's radioactive exclusion zone where, for years, scientists have been growing crops. Rye grain, to be precise. Uh, the, 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 the team of researchers, led by the University of Portsmouth professor Jim Smith, wants to prove that consumable goods can be made using contaminated ingredients. Now, I have no doubt that you could make consumable goods from stuff that is contaminated with radiation. I'm just thinking maybe it's still not going to be real good for you to consume. Just because it's consumable and it's produced with this contaminated crap, that don't mean it's a wise idea. Maybe you want to glow. Maybe you, you want to glow in the dark and so you won't need flashlights or anything. Uh, maybe that's your. Maybe you want to be like Spider Man, you know, and 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 get superpowers. That's probably not going to happen. <laughs> Neither of those are probably going to happen. Uh, but you probably will wind up with um, cancer of some sort. Yeah, vodka. That's really a bomb. Right? That's right, Sock. Uh, anyway, anyway, they've just unveiled their first creation. They, they, the very first consumer product to be made inside the exclusion zone, an artisanal vodka labeled Atomic, and bottled with the newly created Chernobyl Spirit Company. <laughs> Insanity. Our idea was to use the grains to make a spirit," said Professor Smith in conversation with BBC. It's uh, the only bottle in existence. I tremble when I pick it up. Vodka distilled from deep within the Chernobyl exclusion zone feels like something you'd find at the center of a dark Taurus Venn diagram, a seductive blend of macabre fetish, fetish, fetishization and a dangerous thrill-seeking. I'm thinking more on the suicidal end. I don't know if it's really a macabre fetish or thrill-seeking of any kind. I'm thinking it's more of a death wish at that point. I'm pretty sure that's, yeah. Anyway, Smith insists, though, that Atomic is no more radioactive than any other vodka. Um, and that's pretty much the point, he says. Okay. So are you saying all vodka is radioactive? <laughs> Any chemist will tell you, when you distill something, impurities stay in the waste product, he explained. So we took rye that was slightly contaminated. Uh, slightly, that's an interesting word there to use. Slightly. Uh, and, and water from the Chernobyl aquifer. <sighs> also not a wise choice, and distilled it. We asked our friends at Southampton University, who have an amazing radioanalytical lab, to see if they could find any radioactivity. And they couldn't find anything. Everything was below their limit of detection. Dr. Gennady Laptev, a scientist at the Ukrainian Hydro Hydrometeorological Institute in Kiev, and a founding member of the Chernobyl Spirit Company. I wonder if uh, the Bidens have any uh, uh, 
interest in that group. Uh, anyway, they explained to the BBC that the vodka shows how some of the land surrounding damaged Chernobyl reactor can be used productively for things like agricultural enterprise. Yeah, I'm thinking no. I'm thinking no. I don't. I'm not. I'm not gonna eat no Chernobyl corn. <laughs> just saying. We don't have to just abandon the land. Well, only for another four or five thousand more years. Uh, we can use it in diverse ways, and we can produce something that will be totally clean from radioactivity. Sorry, boys. Not trusting you. I'm saying no. I'm saying no, not for me. Thank you all so much for the offer. But no. Anyway, that was on Vice.com there. August 8th of 2019 here. So, uh, yeah, that, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, what a world. <laughs> you know, anybody that really kind of knows me or has chatted with me here in the chat or listened to me on the freaking radio, knows that I'm a big fan of the giant meteor coming down and, bang, resetting the planet Earth. And I've been waiting, waiting, waiting for one. They promise, they promise all the time, huge meteor coming our way, but they never get here. However, apparently, around uh, 12,800 years ago, one did come and caused... An ice age, wiping out dozens of species and decimating humans. 12,800 years ago. Yeah. A team of scientists discovered a platinum spike suggesting, suggesting a meteorite had hit. Found in Wonder Crater in Limpopo Province, north of Pretoria in South Africa. Findings could prove mini ice age, younger Dryas, was triggered by a meteoroid. Huh. wonder if there's any propaganda built into this. All right. <laughs> this, this is on the Daily Mail, October 8th there. Um, so anyway, it says a huge asteroid may have hit Earth 12,800 years ago, causing a global climate change and extinction, according to new evidence found in South Africa. South Africa. Scientists analyzed ancient soil at a site called Wonder Crater and found high levels of platinum, which they say supports the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis that a disintegrating meteor hit Earth and caused a mini ice age. The resulting ice age is believed by many scientists to have wiped out dozens of mammal species, including the mammoth and the giant wildebeest and decimated the human population. Now, I don't know if they're using the word decimated properly here or not, but uh, if you're unaware, the word decimated literally, literally, means to reduce by one-tenth. I think they're using decimated more in the terms of pretty much wiping out, or a huge portion of destruction, rather than saying it was reduced by one-tenth. Now, I don't know what the popula human population was 12,800 years ago. So, it probably wouldn't take all that much. I don't know. Scientists believe platinum spikes found in the ancient soil samples across the world are evidence of the meteor fragments that crashed into Earth. Meteorites enrich platinum and the Wonder Crater site. You guys like repeat yourself. It just like it's like they take a certain sentence and they rephrase it slightly differently. Rock the Cosba. Anyway, until now, proof of the meteorite that meteorites had impacted during the period and potentially led to a mini ice age had only been documented across the northern hemisphere. A total of 28 areas with high levels of platinum had been found. The findings from the researchers at the University of with water sand, with waters rand, in Johannesburg, South Africa, partially support the theory that a meteorite crashed into Earth with global consequences. 
along with another meteorite site discovered in Chile. Or Chile, depending on how you uh, like to pronounce that there. Um, anyway, an episode of rapid cooling named the Younger Dryas, as well as documented period believed to have contributed to the extinction of many species in the l large animals around, that, around those 13,000 years ago. Uh, theories previously pointed to this post-Ice Age cooling as a result of changes in oceanic circulation systems. Another theory was presented by the American scientists in 2007 that the cooling was triggered by a dust fallout of an asteroid impact. So, I, I don't know, it says dust circulating in the atmosphere after an impact could have reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth, affecting plant growth and temperatures on Earth. Now, Francis Thackeray of the Evolutionary Studies Institute at the University of Witter, Witwatersrand in South Africa believes the platinum spike found in South Africa proves the extinction uh, that they're talking about there. So I, I don't know if any of this is right or true. I mean, it's all just hypothesis. People said, just saying, look, we, we found this site here, and we want to say it, 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 it may, that this means that. We don't really have any proof that this means that. Well, we could, you know, draw different lines of semi-logic to point to the fact that this maybe means that. But we, we, we don't know for sure. Anyway, there's more information in the article, should you want to read it there. there's They got videos, which are just animations, of course, uh, showing you how these things work in theory. Um, <laughs> and, they, 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 and, and, and since we're waiting on the 6th, let me just uh, kind of briefly cut over the, uh, uh, the uh, previous five, big five, extinction events. So, yeah, um, uh, the one was the late Ordovician, an ancient crisis around 445 million years ago, saw two major waves of extinction, both caused by climate change. Because, you know, the dinosaurs were driving around in SUVs and caused climate change back then. It was associated with the advance and retreat of ice sheets in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> The late Devonian, this period is now regarded as a uh, number of pulses of extinction spread over 20 million years. It's kind of a difficult one to point out there. It's uh, pulses of extinction spread over 20 million years, beginning 380 million years ago. So 380 to 360 billion years ago. Uh, the extinction event has been linked to major climate change, possibly caused by the eruption of the volcanic Vule Traps area in modern-day Siberia. A major eruption might have caused rapid fluctuations in sea level and might have, could be, sort of, kind of. Um, <laughs> the Middle Permian. Scientists have recently discovered another event 262 million years ago. Uh, it's thereabouts, so they say. It's an approximation. Don't don't pin your don't pin your numbers exactly on that. Anyway, two hundred sixty two million years ago, that rivals the big five in size. This event coincided with the Amesian eruption in what is now China and is known to have caused simultaneous extinctions in the tropics and higher latitudes. The late Permian uh is a mass extinction around two hundred and fifty two million years ago. Uh, which dwarfs all other extinction events, with about 96% of the species becoming extinct. The extinction was triggered by a vast eruption of the Siberian Traps, a gigantic and prolonged vol volcanic event that covered much of the modern-day Siberia. That's Siberia, man. It's just taken a beating, let me say, uh, which led to a cascade of environmental effects. And then number five here is the late Triassic, which was around 201 million years ago. You know, if all these things happened all these 200 plus million years ago, I'd say we're a little overdue for another one, aren't we? 
Uh, anyway, the late Triassic event uh, shares a number of similarities with the late Permian event. It was caused by another large-scale eruption, this time in the Central Atlantic Magmatic Pro Province. Central Agla Atlantic Magmatic Province, which heralded the splitting of the supercontinent Pangaea, Pan Pangaea, where I have you say it, and the initial opening of what would become the Atlantic Ocean. So the Atlantic Ocean is just a child compared to the Pacific. <laughs> Kate, Kate saw that on the Flintstones, so it's true. <laughs> anyway, like I said, there's more to the article. There's uh, videos, actual videos. Well, actual animated videos. <laughs> and since Kate saw it on an animated video, uh, oh, these are just as good as that, or that's just as good as these. Bam, bam! All right. <laughs> oh. Would you eat poop? Would any of you out there eat poop? What if it was poop from bacteria? But what if that poop wasn't just any old poop? What if that poop contained huge amounts of psilocybin. What the hell, psilocybin? That only comes from shrooms. Uh, apparently not. On October 3rd, here on the mindunleashed.com, scientists have created a bacterium that poops huge amounts of psilocybin. Scientists now know how to produce a high-quality, low-cost, industrial-scale strain of psilocybin. Party on, guys! <laughs> All right. Psilocybin, the active uh, hallucinogenic compound found in the magic mushrooms, has increasingly been on the radar of scientists and researchers who believe that it may be helpful in treating anxiety, addiction, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. A new harvesting method, metabolic engineering, may allow industrial-scale production of highly concentrated psilocybin. It only requires bioengineering a bacterium to poop out of its cells. The result, obviously, isn't actual feces. It's not actual poo-poo. <laughs> Unlike some of the more traditional sources of magic mushrooms, which does grow out of cow poop. Um, not made from the cow poop, it just grows out of it. It's just a good a good uh, atmosphere for it to grow in. Anyway, the team from Miami University in Ohio set out to test whether they could stimulate a bacterium, in this case, Escheria coli, E. coli? All right, to produce psilocybin uh, as one of its metabolic byproducts, medical-grade psilocybin production, which typically requires farming crops of the psilocybe cubanus or psilocybe seminalaceta. I don't know if I'm saying these words right. Is expensive, requiring extensive real estate and time to harvest. The end yield is around two dollars per milligram for pharmaceutical-grade psilocybin which is probably not a phrase you've heard much. Pharmaceutical-grade psilocybin. <laughs> However, the researchers at Miami University may have found a biohack that can circumnavigate the traditional barriers to psilocybin production. We are taking the DNA from the mushroom that encodes its ability... Let's quit moving around on me that encodes its ability to make the product and putting it in E. coli. It's similar to the way you make beer through a fermentation process, said biochemist Al Andrew Jones, not Alex, Andrew Jones, in a press release. We are effectively taking the technology that allows for scale and speed of production and applying it to our psilocybin-producing E. coli. After identifying the most optimal prokaryotic, 
Okay. Prokaryotic host named P, P S I L O O 16, whatever, and establishing the best fermentation method with negligible intermediate product buildup. The team used metabolic engineering and bioreactors to create the highest concentration of psilocybin to date. What's exciting is the speed at which we're able to achieve our high production, Jones continued. <laughs> Over the course of this study, we improved production from only a few milligrams per liter to over a gram per liter. That's, that's, a, that's a good, that's a 500-fold increase, as it states. Medical trials for the use of psilocybin continue, and in the meantime, scientists now know how to produce high-quality, low-cost, industrial-scale strain. Party on, Wayne. <laughs> Dudes, I got this, I got this medical-grade psilocybin here. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> wow. Okay. Next. No, 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 no. It's not the Elton John song. It's not Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road. No. It's Goodbye, Anthropogenic Global Warming. Or AGW to you and me. According to Dr. Robert Higgs here, this was put out last January, January 23rd, over here on Electroverse.net. The Earth is now cooling. Yeah, the Earth would be cool, man. According to geologist Dr. Robert Higgs, man-made global warming believers will, by 2021, which is uh, merely a year and two months away, have to admit that they were wrong. Uh, they weren't wrong, they lied. And that the CO2 is uh, blameless for the Svensmark Sun cosmic ray cloud temperatures link is correct. The IPCC's 2013 report says that the sun, that big fireball up there in the sky that warms the planet, gives us light. Yeah, they say that that thing cannot explain global mean surface warming over the past 25 years because solar ir irradiance has declined over that period. But the IPCC assumes Earth's average surface temperature reacts almost instantly to solar output changes with a time lag of less than three years which is cuckoo. Uh, when, when Higgs cross-correlated some cosmic ray and temperature graphs, he found that the mass of ocean thermal inertia causes not a three-year lag, but a 25-year lag. The man-made global warming idea is a fallacy whose time is nearly over, says Higgs. So that's uh, from the article uh, Ice Age Now uh, and... Uh, they have links here to the original article, by the way, should you be so inclined to click through and see that about that. During a solar minimum, the sun's magnetic field weakens and the outward pressure of the solar wind decreases. This allows more cosmic rays, or cosmic debris if you're a Zappa fan, from deep space to penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. The work of H. Svensmach, M. B. Enghoff, uh, and Shavave and other people for over there from that area of the world uh, attributes cosmic rays to cloud nucleation here on Earth. Clouds are Earth's sunshade. And if cloud cover changes for any reason, you have global warming or global cooling. According to Dr. Roy Spencer, the more detailed explanation uh, cosmic rays, cloud seeding, and global cooling is also linked here as well. With this being a grand solar minimum we're entering, the effects will likely be amplified. And on top of that, we're also contending with a pole shift. Don't confuse that with you shifting your own pole. 
a double whammy, and one accelerating faster than most scientists uh, thought possible. Well, most scientists are, well, I'm not even going to say it. I've said it before. <laughs> As the poles migrate, predicted to meet somewhere over in Indonesia within the next few years, our magnetosphere weakens further, down to as low as 10% of its usual strength. The two independent factors, the grand solar minimum and the pole shift, each result in a bombardment of galactic cosmic rays entering our atmosphere, nucleating clouds and cooling the planet. It's a downward spiral from here. One of our modern uh, civilization, one our modern civilization, has never had to contend with, and certainly uh, one no no ill-advised carbon tax can save you from. Carbon tax can't save anybody from anything. It's not designed to save anybody from anything. It's a scam. In fact, the callous money grab has quite the opposite effect. It hinders our preparations. The cold times are here. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Because you're going to want that uh, extra carbon up there in the air, even though the carbon has nothing to do with anything. Uh, those of you that believe that somehow carbon dioxide is a uh, global warming gas. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I've explained it so many times. Uh, I, I just can't explain it anymore. At least not today. I can explain it maybe more in the future, but... Yeah, whatever. <coughs> now, Anti, Anti here, he's uh, he's out there off of... Uh, or uh, around the North Carolina area, is he not? So I think also is Gary L. out there, North Carolina area. Maybe it's South Carolina. Close enough. Close enough, I think. They're not that big a state, so. From WCVB.com. Posted on October 5th. Mysterious glowing orbs. Seen off the North Carolina coast. It kind of looks like, they have a little picture here. It kind of looks like the Phoenix Lights. Very much in a formation's and altitude reminiscent of the Phoenix Lights. However, it's over the ocean rather than over the city or any city. This unexplained cluster of lights was filmed by a passenger on a ferry off North Carolina's Outer Banks. Was it a military exercise? No. Parachute fl flares? No. Or a bona fide, bona fide, UFO squadron maneuvering off the East Coast. Now, I don't know how you bonify something. <laughs> anyway, so far there is no explanation for the glowing orbs filmed last week hovering off over the ocean off of uh, off North Carolina's outer banks. William Guy captured the mysterious cluster of lights in a 31-second video while aboard the ferry in the Pamlico Sound Lagoon. He uploaded it to YouTube on September 28th. As the camera pans uh, to the orbs, Guy can be hurting, uh, heard asking, Can anybody tell me what this is? We're in the middle of the ocean, on a ferry. Nothing around. Look, nothing around. No land, nothing. A person on the boat said, You only see this stuff on TV. The Charlotte Observer was the first to report the story. Last month, the Navy confirmed that three online videos purportedly showing UFOs are genuine. The Navy, for those of you that uh, prefer to have what is termed reliable sources, have, <laughs> have said the UFOs are genuine. Ah, but they stated that the clips should never have been released. What? <laughs> Two of the clips recorded in 2015 and 2004. So, so yeah, the, the Navy said, yeah, they're real. That's a real UFO. I mean, it's a, unidentified, and it's flying, 
and it's an object. Beyond that, we can't really say, because it's unidentified. <laughs> Is it of extraterrestrial origin? We don't know. Is it from another dimension? Can't say that either. Is it a time-traveling type thing? No idea. All we know is that it's not identified, meaning not some of ours. Where did it come from? How come it just disappears? We don't know. All right. Other funny things that going on in space, which I don't know if it's that really funny, but uh, the U.S. never got there. Europe never got there. Not yet, anyway. China, China, however, did. China went to the moon and landed on the dark side of the moon, which apparently is really not all that dark. <laughs> which I'm not really sure I quite understand how it wouldn't be all that dark, being as the fact that no light ever gets to it. That's another topic altogether. This topic here on DigitalTrends.com, posted October 6th, China grows a cotton plant on the far side of the moon in a biological first. China has broken new lunar ground, successfully growing cotton on the moon for the first time. The experiment was part of the Change Chang Chang E four project in which China is exploring the far side of the moon with a lander. This is the same lander that recently discovered a mysterious gel like substance on the moon's surface. Now is that a light, uh, a living thing? Uh, the gel-like substance? Is it the blob? <laughs> anyway, the cotton plant was one of several organisms encased in a mini biosphere weighing just 2.6 kilograms, five, almost six pounds, uh, with a pressure of one atmosphere, which is equal to what we have here on Earth, uh, which was aboard the lander. Uh, the organisms experienced an environment largely similar to that on Earth. However, they did have to contend with both space radiation and microgravity. In an interview with a engineering magazine, IEEE Spectrum, good mag, by the way, uh, project leader for the experiment, Zi Zhengzheng, explained more about the challenges of growing plants in the restricted environment. The weight of the Chang E 4s probe demanded that the weight, or of that experiment, can't exceed three kilograms, he said. That's why it was important to select the biological samples in the experiment carefully. In the end, the team selected five species of biological organisms to send to the moon. Cotton seeds, potato seeds, arabopodis, I don't know what that is, seeds, yeast, and the fruit fly eggs. Some fruit fly eggs. Most of these died quickly, but the cotton seeds sprouted and grew not one, but two leaves. Uh, although the plants have been grown on the International Space Station before, this experiment marks the first time a plant has been grown on the moon. Well, as far as we know, anyhow, the moon could have been all green and lush in, in days gone by. We, 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 we don't know anything about that. However, despite the hardy cotton's best effort, the leaves died within one lunar day, which is equivalent to two weeks on Earth uh, during the, the, the lunar night. Uh, the temperatures on the moon dropped dramatically, and without external weather, the equipment, uh, the equipment could survive. The, 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 the Chinese scientists continued the experiment for several months. So um, there you have it. Space Cotton Race. <laughs> all right, all right. This next article, I, 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 I debated whether or not I should share this with you or not. Because I really have no interest in this asshat 
or, or anything that he's got to say, other than the fact that what he has said is the belief of not just him, probably his entire previous organization, because he's now a former, um, but also most of those that are in the, the various levels of government. I'm going to say that this is what they believe, is what he said. And I'm just going to get right down there to it. So the, the former CIA chief, Brennan, unblinkingly rewrites the entire basis of the United States judicial system in one short sentence. I, I found this on informationliberation.com on October 7th. It was apparently posted on Zero Hedge prior to that. But uh, let me let me, uh, <laughs> let me let me just tell you his words, his exact comments, his his sentence, his beliefs. Brennan unblinkingly states that people are innocent, you know, until alleged to be alleged to be involved in some kind of criminal activity. Let that sink in. I'll read it for you again. Let that sink in. He says, and believes, people are innocent, you know, until alleged to be involved in some kind of criminal activity. No more is required than you are alleged to be involved in some kind of of criminal activity. That's all it takes. That's all that's required is for somebody to allege you. It, it, it's just in some kind of criminal activity. And according to them, criminal activity is anything one of them wrote down on a piece of paper at random and said, this is a crime. So since we said it's a crime, it's a crime, and if you do it, you're involved in some sort of criminal activity. Or if somebody says you did it, you're alleged and no longer innocent. No more I got to say about that. <laughs> oh, man. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think how to launch into this one. Uh, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go, I'll just do it straight the way it's written, <laughs> because, well, I, I, I'll just do it straight the way it's written. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I have, I have many thoughts on this matter. Um, of the maybe possibly great things that could be done with it, but most likely terrible things that could be done with it. Anyway, anyway, here it is on the Guardian dot com, the Guardian dot com, on the twentieth of October. Scientists may have crossed an ethical line in growing human brains. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Neuroscientists may have crossed an ethical Rubicon by growing lumps of human brains in the lab and in some cases transplanting that tissue into animals, researchers warn. The creation of mini brains or brain organoids has become one of the hottest fields in modern neuroscience. The blobs of tissue are made from stem cells, and while they're only the size of a pea, which is about the average size of the politician's brain, size of a pea, some have developed spontaneous brain waves, huh. similar to those seen in premature babies or politicians. Many scientists believe that organoids uh, have the potential to transform medicine by allowing them to probe the living brain like never before. 
but the work is controversial because it's unclear where it may cross the line into human experimentation, as if they never do that. On Monday, researchers will tell the world's largest annual meeting of neuroscientists that some scientists working on organoids are perilously close to crossing the ethical line, although they don't know where that line is. While others may have already done so by creating sentient lumps of brain. Sentient. Got that? These lumps of brain are sentient. In the lab. If there's even a possibility of the organoid, organoid being sentient, we could be crossing that line. According to Elon Ohayon, director of Green Neuroscience Laboratory in San Diego, we don't want people doing research where there's the potential for something to suffer. Now, I'm not sure. I mean, if your brain or a brain, lab grown or otherwise, is there by itself, could it suffer? I, I mean... Your brain sends out signals to various other organs or nerves or whatever, but if it's not connected to any organs or nerves, where well, those signals really aren't going anywhere. So does the brain suffer itself? Um, I, I, I don't know that. I don't know that. I mean, you know, I get headaches, but... Yeah. Anyway, because of the manifestation difficulties in studying the live human brains, organoids are considered to be a landmark development. They have been used to investigate schizophrenia and autism, and why some babies develop small brains when they are infected with Zika virus in the womb. Researchers hope to use organoids to study a raft of brain disorders, from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's to eye conditions such as age-related macular degeneration. But in the presentation to the Society of Neuroscience meeting in Chicago, Ohioan and his colleague uh, Ann Lamb and Paul Sang will argue that checks must be in place to ensure that brain organoids do not experience suffering. And I don't know how you, how, you, how you can ensure such a thing. We're already seeing activity in the organoids that is reminiscent of biological activity in developing animals. In one recent study, researchers at Harvard showed that brain organoids develop in a, a, a rich diversity of tissues from the cerebral cortex neurons to retinal cells. Organoids, organoids grown for eight months develop their own neuronal networks and that sparked with activity and responded when light was shown on them. In another study led by Fred Gage at the Salk Institute in San Diego, researchers transplanted human brain organoids into mouse brains and found that they connected up to the animal's blood supply and sprouted fresh connections. Huh. All right. I, I don't know, man. Uh, yeah. The, the, <laughs> if you could just grow a brain, just plop some some cells down on a on a petri dish, and grow your own brain, and then that brain springs to life by itself and becomes a sentient being. That's it's a little bit freaky. Now, I, I don't know about their ethics or what they call ethical lines that they may be crossing or not, but uh, it is very interesting. I, I I don't trust them to not do bad things with it, however. Not at all. How about if they take one of those brains they grow and put it inside of a, like a robot, an a, 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 a android type thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I don't know. Anyway, whatever. All right. Take a look around you. Do you see people around you? I don't. I, there's nobody here with me. But if there was one other person over here, here with me, then that person would be wrong. So if you see another person in your field of view, and you disagree with what this has to say here, then that other person is wrong. If you see a lot of people, at least half of them are wrong. <laughs> On news, news thud, news thud dot com Poll. Over half of Americans say the First Amendment is too lenient on hate speech and should be updated to reflect today's cultural norms. In other words, if I don't like what you're saying, I should be able to stop you from saying it. And free speech means nothing. That's what this comes down to. Over half of Americans, 51%, say the First Amendment goes too far in allowing hate speech and should be updated <laughs> to reflect today's sensibilities, or as they call it, cultural norms. Uh, the, the survey was conducted last month by the Campaign for Free Speech, which said the results demonstrate just how vulnerable free speech protections are in the good old U.S. of A. The poll also found that 48% of Americans believe that hate speech should be against the law. But who's to determine what hate speech is? Oh, those guys, them, they get to tell you what hate speech is. The only age group with a majority of agreeing uh, that were millennials, 51%, in addition, 54% of respondents said a consequence for hate speech should be to lock your ass up. You said something that offended me. I want to send you to jail. In addition, 57% of Americans said the government should be able to take action against newspapers and TV stations that publish content that is biased, inflammatory, or false. If that were the case, all TV stations and newspapers would all be thrown in jail, or whatever it is you want to do to the TV stations and newspaper people. Because they all, all they print is content that is biased, inflammatory, and false. <laughs> Oh, uh, but of course, if you're one of them, you're, less people think you should go to jail for that than they do for your individual beliefs there on that. The findings are extraordinary. Campaign for Free Speech Executive Director Bob Leistad told the Washington Free Beacon, Our free speech rights and our free press rights have evolved well over 200 years, and people now seem to be rethinking them. He added to the paper that, I think our findings are fueled in large part because of the rise of hate speech, but traditionally, hate speech is protected in the First Amendment. The Supreme Court upheld that principle time and time again. So, if you insult somebody, they want to put you in jail for it. Oh, you, you didn't use my proper pronoun! <laughs> you, you didn't know that I was feeling like a she rather than a he today or whatever <laughs> oh god alright and finally shocking or not I don't know this was posted on uh Circleofdocs.com, uh, and it, apparently it's, it happened, I don't know. HPV vaccine. American College of Pediatricians issues rare warning against vaccine due to premature ovarian failure. 
to, to have any doctor going against any vaccine is is amazing. But apparently, according to this here, the uh, American College of Pediatricians has issued a warning against the vaccine that has been approved by the FDA and the CDC. So, yeah, I I I, I, don't, I could talk to you more about it, but I mean that that's the uh, that's that's the core right there, that that first kind of paragraph sentence. So, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, that's going to wrap it up. I'm out of town. I'm here on Grim Leftovers. I'll be back next Monday with another episode, and that will be episode 48. This is episode 47, by the way, in case I failed to mention that, which I'm pretty sure I did fail to mention that earlier on. Uh, anyway, thank you all for tuning in and uh, playing along there in the chat. I, I didn't get back to the chat very much to respond to your comments. I tried, but, you know, I'm busy making things up in my head as we go along. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for tuning in. Um, tomorrow is going to be uh, in a perfect world with Flash and Vin E at 1 p.m. Eastern. So check that out. Uh, check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for all of the rest of the shows here on RLM Radio. Appreciate y'all being here and being part of the show, being with me tonight. Have yourselves a great one. Peace.